We are gonna get started just in a few minutes here, guys. Cassie, are you ready to get going? Yep, if everybody else is. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we have a good amount of people on it. Um, so it should be recording, so we should be good to go. Okay, sounds good. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Obviously, welcome to CMA training and listing paperwork training. Um, feel free to stop me at any time if you guys have any questions. I just picked a random property to come out today, um, one that I had sold a couple years ago, uh, actually in 2021. So feel free to stop me if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of jump right into it. First thing I want to just acknowledge when we're doing CMAs is there's a ton of different ways to do them, right? I mean, everyone does them a little bit different. Today's focus, I'm more focusing on just actually pricing it out versus putting together that pretty CMA folder, right? Um, you know, there's a multitude of ways to do that as well in your listing presentation, but today I'm just focusing on getting the numbers. Um, I happen to have an iPad as well as my laptop. Before I got the iPad, I would typically print the property out. Um, the old listing, and then also the tax records, because I'm looking at a lot of different data when I'm doing this. Now I have an iPad, so it's a little bit easier, and I just pull up the old MLS on my iPad. I have this next to me on my laptop when I'm actually running the numbers. The reason for that is because I want all the data on the house, right? Um, I want to... I just don't have a good enough memory to look at it once and remember four bedrooms, two baths, 2,500 square feet, whatever. So having the property up for me is super helpful. I also want to take it a step back that when I um, create the listing appointment with a potential client um, and I'm on the phone with them, I'm asking them some questions. Have you done anything to the home since you last purchased it? Anything of significant value? Sometimes you get, you know, people who want to go on and ramble on for hours about the, the minute things that they did that uh, don't matter. But, you know, have you remodeled the kitchen? Have you remodeled the bathroom? And the reason I want to know that is because it's important. You know, I'm always looking at the old MLS, but maybe they have outdated bathrooms or kitchens, and I don't want to be making price adjustments based on the home that they purchased, knowing that, um, they've done some upgrades to it. I also always ask the seller what they owe on the property. And I explain the reason I'm asking you this, because some people are like, why do you need to know that information? I will explain to them that I'm going to prepare a net sheet for them. That's going to show them, you know, if you sell here and you owe this, and, um, these are the fees associated with selling, here's your bottom line. One thing that I don't ever do is ask the homeowner what the, they think the home is worth. This is something that um, agents disagree on, and I'll tell you both sides of why I choose not to do it. I choose not to do it because I want the data and the facts to speak for themselves, right? I don't want, regardless of what they think the home is worth, I don't want that playing in my mind. I don't want to be like, oh my gosh, I'm only coming up with 350 and they think it's worth 400. And now I'm trying to justify this 400 number, right? I really just want the facts to speak to themselves. The flip side of that, on some agents who I do know ask the seller what they think the home is worth before they go, they want to know what they're walking into. She's, you know, another uh, agent that I work, she's always like, well, if I know that they think it's worth 400 and I know it's only worth 350, I want to build my stronger case on it being 350. So I can see both sides of that. 
Um, you know, you do whatever makes you most comfortable, but I just personally don't ever ask that. And then when I'm at the home, I tell them that you'll know that I never asked you what you think the home is worth because what you think the home is worth is really irrelevant to the actual data that I brought here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have the estimate and I don't even typically look at that. Um, I know a lot of agents do. Um, again, in the beginning, I said there's so many different ways to do a CMA and everybody has different processes. Um, the other thing is when it's like a home in my area or my city. I don't know what else. Well, I think it's my computer, but I don't know. Um, you know, I can almost price out a four bedroom, two bath split level home in my area without even having to pull comps. You know what I mean? I could drive by and be like, ah, that's probably right around this price. Um, so Zillow and those things, I don't rely a lot on, but I know other agents do. And, and there's just no right or wrong answer to that. Also where I was going with that is if I have a harder property to comp out um, where I've been struggling, I sometimes will go to an agent that I, you know, I'm friends with, hey, can you comp this out? And I always find it interesting that we have access to the same MLS and they can come up with comps I didn't even find. And I'm like, where, how did you find that? You know, so just know that I'm kind of showing you guys my methods, but this isn't the end all sale, right? You might have, and, and anybody who has something that they want to speak up over while I'm going over this, um, feel free, except Hannah. <laughs> I was going to say, I also really love the question when you're um, pre-calling a seller. Who, what was that? The decision? I said, I love when we asked the question, who are the decision makers in selling this home? Just mm. in case parents are involved, an ex-wife, an ex-husband. It's just good to know who you're going to be dealing with as you're walking into that appointment. Yeah, I think that's also fair. Like I said, I usually have my tax records pulled up and that's kind of another question that I ask them to like, oh, I see that you and, um, you know, maybe it's a spouse or a family member, Alyssa, own the house together. Will you both be at the appointment? You know, is there any other parties that I need to be aware of in this process? I agree with that 100%. Um, all right, so now I am gonna go ahead and share the, my screen so I can actually get into the MLS. Okay, so like I said, for today's um, purposes, I just picked an old MLS um, that I have up on my iPad next to me, and I start my search pretty basic. Um, the other thing is I will pull actives and coming soons. Not all agents do that. Um, I do that because I want to show the client what they're up against, what's currently on the market. Some agents choose not to do that, which is fine as well, because an appraiser is not using that for value, mm -hmm. right? But I, I typically pull three actives, three pendings, three scolds, and I bring all of that data with me. So in this case, I'm going to do coming soon, active, pending, and closed. And I first do my search where I'll start about a half a mile within the MLS the old MLS. Now this obviously gets trickier if property's never been on the MLS before. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other ball game in in general, but we're just gonna pretend for you, today. You can't put a PID in there. It has to be an MLS number. Um, well, I mean, PIDs will pull up the tax record, but it's not gonna show up the old MLS. And when you pull up the tax records, it doesn't always show if they finished a basement, added a bathroom. This, the tax record information isn't always accurate, you know? So I feel like if it's never been listed in the MLS, I'm doing a lot more digging with the homeowner before I even go to my first appointment to get as much preliminary information about the property as I can. So in this case, again, coming soon, active, pending, and closed. And I'm gonna start with about a half a mile of the property. And I'm gonna do all single family homes because this property is single family. So I'm not gonna obviously compare it to, um, townhomes. Uh, and then I am just going to go to, where is the other box that I'm looking for? The list date. Oh, it's up in status. Um, oh no, here, right here, this list date. 
So I just start with zero to 90. So I keep my information very basic on the initial search, right? In this case, I am only getting six, six matches. So I might be able to have enough data with these six matches to come up with my list price. If this search would have resulted in, okay, let me see, let's do two miles. Did that change anything? Yeah, it doesn't really look like it did. But had this search resulted in a lot more results, I would have started narrowing my information down a little bit more. Maybe I would have started narrowing it down within 500 square feet of my house, or I would have started putting bathroom and bedroom counts in. Um, but right now we have six, six results. So no, no, that's a lie. It didn't update. So you can see there, okay, when we expanded our search, we had a lot more results that came up. I'm gonna go back to the criteria because I don't want to weed through that many properties. I'm gonna go back to our comfort zone of a half a mile here. And obviously that half mile, if you're in a rural area where you're on acreages, you're probably not going to get a whole lot within a half a mile. So these are just kind of the, I hate to say common sense things, but those are the kind of the common sense things that you gotta think about when you're creating this initial search criteria. So we have six, Properties here, I have two active. <laughs> I swear I didn't plan this out. I literally picked this property about 30 seconds before we walked back here. Um, okay, so we have the first one. I'm just going to take a look at it um, and start looking. This one listed at 450. It's four bedroom, three bath. My subject, I know you guys at home can't see this because I have it on my iPad next to me. I have a four bedroom, two bath house. Okay, so I have an additional bathroom here. And I'm looking at the total square footage is 2,800. Well, I have 1,400. Okay, this probably isn't a very good comp because this property has significantly more square footage than mine. Obviously, if I was struggling finding comps, I might come back to this one and make some adjustments for this having significantly more um, square footage than my subject property. Do you tend to, if you have a larger amount of comps, to go to the style of the home, whether it be you know one story or three and a half? Yep, so are the people that are online able to hear the people in the room when they're asking questions? Yep. Okay, I just wanna make sure, otherwise I would repeat them. It's nothing more frustrating than just to hear me talking and not know the answer, <laughs> what I'm answering. Um, so she asked, you know, am, if I get a lot of searches, am I going to start dwindling it down by the style type? And yes, absolutely. In this particular area of Blaine, in this particular property, there's so many different style of homes in that area. You know, it's not like some neighborhoods are all splits, you mm -hmm. know, or this mm -hmm. or that. I know this particular is an older area of Blaine, but yeah, back to my point of like how everybody kind of does these searches a little bit differently. There might be others who may have started right off that, like not only single family, but would have narrowed that down more to two stories or split levels. Okay. Um, it's also interesting because this is a modified split. So that kind of makes it a little bit more unique too, because does it lean more towards the two stories or the splits? Um, all right, so back to my results. So again, this one I would kind of say is out. So I might now uh, change my search criteria to get a little bit more actives, but I'm gonna go to like, here's a closed one. Listed at 350, sold for 382. Total bedrooms, three bedroom, three bath. Again, my subject is four bedroom, two bath. So I almost say to those equal each other out. I have an additional bedroom, but they have an additional bathroom. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. So we have this adjustment opportunity within the current. Do you adjust like you just did in your head? Or do you actually go from the, okay, I find X dollars to a bedroom, X dollars to a bedroom? I just do it in my head. Okay. Um, and you have a little bit more experience. <laughs> right. And that's where it's kind of unique because it's harder without, you know, if you're newer to really know what some of those adjustments are. I know typically an appraiser gives about $5,000 for a bedroom, you know, and a bathroom. I would say anywhere between $2,500 and $5,000 as well. Um, so in my mind right now, I'm kind of like, okay, mm -hmm. now total fair square footage on this one is $1,800. I'm at $1,400. That's close enough mm -hmm. for me, right? I'm feeling like this is a pretty solid comp. Um, and then I'm going to go in and start looking at the photos to see kind of how it compares. 
that's another thing that I do on my listing appointments is I actually bring the photos mm -hmm. of all of the comps that I'm showing them. And the reason for that is I want the seller to look at what I'm looking at. Look, look at this property and compare it to yours. Either it's nicer or it's not. I also saw in the Asia remarks that there were multiple offers. Yep. To keep that in mind when you're talking to sellers. Yep. Because the market's different now. Right. You may not get multiple. A hundred percent. You know, multiple offers received on this one, but this was also five days ago. Or no, it wasn't. This no, was in was May. Um, so all of those things are great talking points. Just like you said, if I was going on this listing appointment today, I would say, yes, this sold in multiple offers, but that was in May. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. Um, so yes, they they went $30,000 over their asking price in May. I don't know that if we we should accept that. Like if I was making a, or expect that, not accept. If I was like making, a, if I had to make a hard decision right now, my list price would probably land at about 375. Cassie? Just because this one sold at 382.5 and I'm making a little bit of adjustments. Back to your question, how did I come up with that? A lot of that's just more knowledge and experience of where I'm like, okay, I'm confident in this number. Yeah. What did you say the appraiser comes in at roughly for a bathroom? I would say anywhere between 2,500 and five. I think that depends on the square footage of the house, how many bathrooms it had before, you know, if you have in, in an appraiser, if we brought an appraiser in here, which maybe isn't a bad idea, actually, um, Holly, I don't know if she's around, we should consider that, but bringing an appraiser in here probably wouldn't be a bad idea. In my mind, how much value that bathroom adds is dependent on a few things. Was it only a one bedroom house? Well, or I'm sorry, a one bathroom house. If it was already only a one bathroom house and you're adding another one. I think that that provides a little bit more value than if you already had a three bedroom house and you were adding Mm -hmm. another bathroom you know what I mean so it's all of these things that it's like there's not and appraisers have a lot of different metrics that and things that they're looking at and they're looking more data I'm also taking the data that I'm looking at here in the MLS but also thinking from a perspective of buyers and I know what they're looking for and wanting in a property right mm -hmm. so it's like some of it's all just kind of a little bit combined mm -hmm. Um, then we have this one at 490. I'm probably not even, I, I don't even really need to look at it because I feel like this is way out of realm of where my property is even at. I feel like the last one we just looked at narrowed me down to a little bit closer to the 375 price point. So now I'm probably more on a hunt to find a little bit more properties at that price point. So that's when I'm going to go back to my criteria. And maybe I do stretch this out to a mile instead of the five that I was at. And now maybe I'll do this to 120 and I can even do things like my price point okay you know we were narrowing down to the 375 so now maybe I'm going to look at anything that matches all these other criterias but still between 350 and 400. Now I got a couple more um, you know here's one for 395 this is split And it be fogging down you guys with, <laughs> you know, it's going slow. Mm -hmm. So four bedroom, three bath. The other thing that I know about the property that I'm comping out, and again, you guys can't see it at home and it could be different now, but at the time that I sold this house, the condition of the siding was really rough. So we took that into consideration when I had kind of my low range to my high range of comps that I found you know, I really stuck with the sellers. Like we need to hit the lower range here because you do need new siding. Now the flip side of that, had they put brand new siding on it and spent 25 grand, would I have added $25,000 of value to the property? Not at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something that homeowners also struggle a lot with. And I have to explain to them, like if your home is in need of a lot of repair, buyers walk through and they're adding these up in their head and they're subtracting it from the sales price. But if your home already has these things, they're not walking through and adding. It provides scalability. It doesn't provide a whole lot of value. I mean, even myself personally, two years ago, we stuck about a hundred some thousand dollars into my house, only raised my house value by about 50. And that was, you know, the main values of the things that I redid in my house was because of the kitchen. But we also did new roof, siding, windows. The roof, siding, and windows didn't provide me a whole lot of value, but they sure cost me an awful lot. So this one, four bedroom, three bath, three car garage. I also only have a two car garage. 
um, listed at 395. And now I'm gonna start looking at pictures. Okay, here again, my subject property I know has not very nice siding. This has a lot of curb appeal. It looks like it has relatively new siding. Large deck on the backyard. So I'm looking at pictures too when I'm looking through all of these things. Okay, this house needs a paint job, which, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, back when <laughs> we're laughing at this, but I would venture to even say, eh, this was a live and accepted offer. Okay, let me push this property back to last year. This purple paint wouldn't have mattered, right? This house would have sold a had no issue if it has shifted a bit i'm coming in there to tell the seller we need to get some neutral paint in here because not all buyers can see beyond that right not all buyers can but when the market was aggressive and everybody was receiving 35 offers on a three hundred and ninety five thousand dollar house you didn't necessarily have to do those things but now when the market's shifting you need to put your home in its best light to attract all the right buyers um, I know some of you maybe even heard about the property that I sold a couple months ago here in Farmington. Um, they had taken their own pictures and they insisted on I using them and I, I didn't want to because they were dark. They weren't terrible pictures, but they were dark and I just know that they weren't as great as our professional photos. We put it up on a Wednesday and we were hardly getting any activity. And so Thursday I said, I'm ordering professional photos tomorrow. We got them, I put them up Saturday, and then all of a sudden showing started flooding in. So your photography does make a, a huge difference in whether you get um, activity on the property or not. And again, that's a change from last year. I think you could have taken crappy cell phone photos a year ago and threw them up and it didn't matter. You know, if it was in the buyer's price point, they were going to look at the house. Um, I know that's kind of getting off topic of the CMAs themselves, but just all great talking points when you're going on these listing appointments with buyers or with sellers. Um, here's one pending at 375, four bedroom, two bath, two car garage, 3,600 square feet. So this has significantly more square footage, but what I personally know about this home and Sharon and I were talking about this earlier, I know where this property is located because it's kind of in my neck of the woods and this is off a busier area and not as nicer part of Blaine. So 375, it has significantly more square footage, but I know that the neighborhood my, my property is in is more desirable. And even though this one has more square footage, I might have people leaning towards my subject property more because of its location. So these are all things that just kind of come with experience and can make it difficult if you're comping out a property in a neighborhood that you're not really aware of. Another thing Sharon and I had talked about is um, like Blaine, Andover, and Oka area where I'm from, we're all District 11 schools. We're the same district, but our high schools are a lot different. Like people want in Andover High School versus Anoka or Blaine because a lot of reasons Andover just won like state hockey championships and that makes a big difference for parents and sports and it does impact value um so again this one has a lot more square footage but i would say i could have some adjustments being made for that square footage in the price with my comp just knowing where the location of this one is versus my comp does that make sense mm -hmm. all right um so kind of going through the properties again, I actually feel pretty confident at 375 on this one. It, did I go through enough like information and data for you guys to see where I kind of arrived at that? Um, Cause again, I know a lot of it was just based on my market knowledge of this particular area, but the more you do these, the quicker it can, can become because you know of knowing those, those different things. Um, where was I going to go next? Um, oh, just an interesting point. So this comp that I'm using that I sold in 2021 listed at 300. And now my point is kind of at 375. However, if they hadn't done any work to the property based on where the condition of this property was, I'd actually probably be backing that up to about 355. Does that make sense? Because again, it needed new siding. It needed new carpet throughout. The kitchen was updated 
since the home was built, but not the new brand new white and all the, you know, um, there was a nice addition put on the back. And I also know that this yard was pretty small and the driveway was kind of beat up. So like the comps tell me based on bedroom, bath count, garage and square footage that were probably at 375, but I would be going into that listing probably at, I would probably do three different price points. And I would do 350, 355 and 360. And that's what I'd be coming at to them to present to them where I think that we should list at. Do you guys have any questions on that? Go ahead. Do you already like the RPM or the RPR? Um, so a lot of times I will take a look at taxes. So like right now, if I went and hey, looked Cassie, at would you, be able to, would you be able to say what the question was? Oh, um, if I ever look at RVM, I go into um, ta the tax records. So like right now, looking at the tax records on this comp that I'm looking at, let me see if I can find it because every city is different. Um, I use AVM to answer your question. So the AVM range for the city on this particular property as of June is anywhere from 300 to 375. Mm -hmm. And that, again, I don't put a lot of weight on it and I don't look at that beforehand, but it's a good thing to go look at because I feel like, okay, their top range, even at the city is at 375. I'm definitely in the ballpark. Now, last year or the year before, I actually feel like I would have been above the AVM because properties were selling far above, you know, the tax, the county's AVM numbers. So um, I feel like we're probably entering a market where we're getting a lot more in line with the AVM. Yeah. Of my um, subject, do you want the address, the old MLS? Uh, 12701 Isanti Street. So Hannah just asked for the address. She's probably going to look it up. I probably should have given that to you guys before I started. So you could have pulled it up on your own as well. well at it. So Hannah pulled it up on Remind because they give an evaluation as well. What, did, what number are they coming up with? 357-136. There I was. Perfect. So, all right. Any questions on that or anything you guys want me to discuss a little bit more in depth on how I went through that. I know it was kind of quick, but if you guys don't have any questions, then I'm gonna run into the actual listing paperwork itself. Cassie, I got one super quick. Sure. <laughs> um, what happens, or and, and maybe it's just for a different discussion, when you can't find one, like one is so unique and like you're not going, you know, you're going two miles out now, five miles out, how? So that's where I said earlier, I have even now, Jen, will reach out to agents um, and tell them I'm struggling copying this property. Can you run it? You run it as well. Or what if you reach out to an agent who typically sells in that area? Yeah, I mean, I would probably start with agents on my team first. Yeah. You know what I mean? Agents on my team, agents in, within my network saying like, hey, I'm really struggling copying out this property. Can you take a look? I don't know a single agent in this room or probably even on this um, Zoom call that wouldn't help, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jen, I know you've done that as well, right? Like, hey, I'm mm -hmm. struggling with this. And, and that's the unique thing about CMAs and how everybody kind of does them a little bit differently is like I said earlier, I've literally had somebody helping me comp out a property that I was really struggling with. Mm -hmm. And he found four comps that I was like, what? Where, where did that come yeah. from? And then I actually felt like an idiot because I was like, how did I miss that? Mm -hmm. But that's where a second set of eyes can really help. If you, you know, when I'm running these, if I'm confident on my numbers, like I am right now, I don't ask for a second opinion, but if I am in any way struggling, even if I came up with a number, but I just felt like, man, I really battled to come up with that. I have another agent just do mm -hmm. another complete market run as well so because then I go into my seller with confidence as well and we'll tell them like hey I struggled a little bit finding comps for your property so I brought another agent in to help as well maybe that could burn me someday where they feel like oh you weren't even confident enough to pull I feel like it helps me like hey it's not just my opinion coming in here I brought some other seasoned agents in to give their valuation of it as well I think you've done that haven't you Nate how did that go over I haven't been involved yet. Did just they? Just like a second opinion. Like, yeah. Trust you, but having just a second look. Right. Makes us feel 
Yeah, because Nate and I sat down and did that one day. He had a property that he was struggling comping, and rightfully so. It wasn't an easy one to comp. But I think the same thing happened that day. You were kind of like, oh, I didn't see that comp. And, you know, so, and I think you had comps that I was like, I didn't see that one. All right. So now I'm going to go into the listing paperwork. Um, I'm just going to pull up my comp because I actually start there. So this is the property itself for those of you on Zoom. Um, I will actually start my listing paperwork in here, even though it's the old listing. So is this now assuming you got the listing? Nope. When I go on a listing appointment, and again, this is everyone else varies, but I'm going on every listing appointment assuming I'm going to get the listing, right? And I go in there kind of try with that confidence. Um, and I have all of my listing paperwork prepared to go in. Um, and in fact, we won't have enough time to go over it today, but um, if anybody is interested, I do my whole listing presentation on my iPad. And in fact, they're able to sign on my iPad and it makes life like so, so easy because I can leave the listing appointment, go into this um, app that I have, email the listing coordinators, everything like it just, it's, literally life-changing when I started doing this a year ago. Um, yeah, yep. Um, so yes, to answer the question, I come in with all the listing paperwork because I'm trying to get that signed. I don't do a lot of two-step CMA appointments. I want to get it signed here and there. Um, so I'm not going to go back to creating templates because I have training on that in our YouTube channel. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to use my HT listing template. And then I'm going to add myself as the seller's landlord agent and I'm going to create a new transaction. Again, sorry guys, it's just everybody kind of being on the internet. It's taking a little bit more time. Okay, Kevin, can you back up like from the CMA? Where did you go? Oh, yeah, I, so that's the other thing I kind of talked about in the beginning. Some people use that CMA program in there. And um, honestly, the only time I use the CMA program in there is if I have people going through a divorce and they need something for an attorney. Um, but otherwise, I literally pull the comps into my iPad. I pull the listing paperwork, in, and I'm literally going through the comps with them on my iPad. I don't put together a nice, fancy CMA um, to each their own on that. I'm not saying there's a right way or wrong way to do that. Um, this is just how I do my. I literally pull the information sheet and all the photos for the different comps that I'm using. Okay, so you're, you're in MLS. And you started where? Yeah. I went to the listing and oh. then I went to Instanet okay. up at the top. So it's pulling all the information from the previous listing. So I do need to delete things like the list price, right? Um, transaction dates, I can put today as the list date. Um, expiration date. This is another thing that everybody does a little bit differently. And again, I don't feel like there's a right or a wrong way. I typically do mine for six months. Some agents do theirs for a standard of a year. Another idea that I kind of liked is I worked with an agent who always um, did December 31st on all of their listings, no matter when they were listing it. Kind of creative because then you always know the date that your listings are going to expire. Um, I mean, maybe that doesn't work so well if you're meeting with the seller on December 15th. Oh, then he probably does just, he probably actually did December of the following year. Not a bad strategy. Um, again, to each their own on this, but I typically do mine like six months. Um, I'm just going to go to the end of November on this one. And obviously I'm deleting out things from the previous listing. And why is it that you go into the old one instead of starting a new transaction? Sure. So the question of why am I going into the old one instead of just starting a new one is because it imports a lot of the data from the old listing and I don't have to retype it in. And if you would have just, because I typically go in when I'm starting a new one, I'll put in the PID information and it'll pull information from 
Yep. Well. So there's no, I, you know, I don't, okay. whatever you're comfortable with. I don't think that my way is better than your way. But they both pull the same. They thing both out. pretty much, I think, I think going to the MLS, it pulls a little bit more information. Okay. Um, yeah, because then I think the only difference would be when you do it the other way, you don't have to delete. Anything. You don't have to delete things, correct. If you were to do it the way that you're talking, you're not having, I just find that I don't have to delete so much. And this is just how I've always done it. Yeah. And habits die hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so here's also where I would add my sellers. I can't even remember what these sellers' names were. So I'm just going to add some people. We're just going to pretend that he is the seller for today. Now, don't let anybody have me hit submit or send stuff because <laughs> um, so we're going to pretend that they're the seller. And then these are all the documents that I pull up when I'm creating a listing. I have this net sheet. You need agency. Single family listing input form. Back to Sharon, your point. I actually don't go ahead and fill out this whole form until I get the signed listing paperwork just because it's putsy. Unless I'm going on like a personal listing where I know it's going to get signed. I might, and if I have the time, I'll go ahead and do this whole listing input. I also do uh, the withhold and coming soon because I don't know at this point if the client's going to be ready within 21 days or not. So I bring both forms showing instructions. Um, so going back to the net sheet and do these in the order that they're in my list. The one thing that I will admit that I hate about the proceeds sheet here is it's all manual. Um, I've actually thought about emailing our broker. Maybe I'll do that today to see if they can get one that's not manual. Oh, do they? Okay. Hannah says watermark has a really good one. Um, okay. That's really nice. Um, this is the one that I've been using, but let's say, you know, and it has three different price points and I typically do all three different price points because maybe I'm getting to the house and they have some nice things that I hadn't taken into consideration. And I feel like, Oh, maybe we could get five or $10,000 more for the house than I had initially thought. Um, I'm not going to go, I don't know if you guys would find it beneficial to go through this whole form or not. Um, can I just go in here and print that? Can I just fill it up by hand? Yeah, you can go in there and print it. So I don't fill out all of the areas on this form. Okay, let's say I'm going to pretend for today's sake that they owed $150,000 on the property. Oops. Um, and sorry guys, I'm having to move you around on Zoom quite a bit here. I don't do a lot of these prepayment, all of these. I'm actually scrolling all the way pretty much down to commissions. And here's where um, previous brokerages I was in, I could just put the percentage and it auto calculated it for me. Um, and then closing services, I usually put about 600 in here or 650. I know that's on the higher end. But I actually explain this to my sellers when I'm going through these numbers is um, some of my numbers might be a little bit high. If you case the table and you have a little bit more money in your pocket, then have been too low and you're not getting as much as you expected. Um, so I would put in a closing fee, the broker commission, which I'm not going to calculate out just for time's sake, the broker admin fee. And then um, balance of real estate taxes, I typically always put a half year in there. Um, and I explain to sellers, look, this is gonna get prorated to the date of closing. But again, I'd rather put you in a better situation with doing a half year's taxes because in Minnesota, taxes are paid upfront and in arrears. Um, so again, it, you could actually be getting a credit back at closing when I've created a deduct deduction here, but that's putting you in a far better situation than the opposite, right? Um, oh, I guess it does 
calculate down here. It just doesn't do the broker commission. Which is weird. Every time I've heard it before, I always have the option of putting percentage in. Yeah. So just real quick, guys. I maybe some of you are intelligent enough to do this in your head, but I'm not. So let's pretend we're charging a six percent commission on three fifty. That's twenty one thousand dollars. Uh, not two hundred. All right. Um, so then this is showing the cash to seller. Right. Um, and this helps when I'm going over the numbers. So I know we're not getting so much into the listing presentation, but that's kind of, you know, I'm saying, okay, if we list here and you owe this and here's the commissions, here's the closing fee, here's the broker admin fee, here's your real estate taxes. This is, you know, approximately what you're walking away with. What do you think about that? Um, so that's the, and then I also know PHT has a net sheet as well um, that I have a copy of if anybody's interested in using that. Um, I think, you know, this one, Parker sent it to me a long time ago, so I don't really know. It's an Excel spreadsheet and I don't find it as easy to print as this form in here, which is why I tend to lean on this form. Agency, there's not really anything to do on the agency form because there's just needing signatures on that. Do you go over in depth with them to read each one? Um, like each, each relationship that, or you just point out, this is the one you're signing on based on the fact that I'm listing your home. Like some people are like, what is this? And it's like- So if you want me to go over agency quick, I mean- No, today's... no, 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 you don't okay. have to do that. I'm just asking, do you go over with them every time? Yes. Okay. Agency or specifically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, with listing appointments, yep, I go through my normal verbiage. And if anybody wants to have another like meeting going over exactly what I say in a listing appointment on some of these documents, I'm happy to do that as well. I think today's focus was more about showing you how to price a home and what documents you need and how those documents need to be filled out. But if any of you feel like it would be beneficial to do like a role playing type scenario where we actually review the documents and what's said at the appointment, I'm happy to do that too. Certification to withhold. Um, this actually appears to be the wrong document I have in my template. Um, I apologize for that. That was a weird one. Yeah, I've never seen that. Um, there is a certification to withhold, guys. That is the wrong form. Okay, let me focus on the exclusive right to list because it's probably one of the most important forms. Date. Then we have the property address. And again, all this stuff was imported. List price, I actually leave this blank going on any listing appointment because even though I have my numbers in mind, the seller and I could settle on something else. You know, maybe I get there and I'm set at 355 and they're like, I really want to list at 360. And I'm like, eh, five grand's not the big deal. Fine, let's do 360. On the flip side of that, there could be times where I'm like, adamant about no. 355 is with them. So going through, through this, um, again, I'm not gonna go line by line with what the documents mean. I'm more just focusing on how to complete them today. So option one, two, three, and, and four should all be yes. Um, some of you may have been taught that option four should be no. And that's actually incorrect. If you don't have yes on all of these, they cannot be um, IDX cert sent to all of our websites. For example, if you check no on option four, marketing team cannot put it on Facebook. Comments have to be allowed. Um, and I explained to sellers like, hey, our marketing team monitors that. If negative comments are made, they're going to delete it. But because Facebook is a public website that allows commenting, if you're not agreeing to allow this, then we can't market it on those particular websites. Also, the, to check the no box. So a lot of people were told to check the no box. We're not going to throw the person under the bus who, who started that. <laughs> um, but the correct thing should be that all of these are marked yes. Listed for lease, I always check is not and may not be during the duration of this contract. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Though, yeah. Um, I mean, I can see it from both sides, but having an automation, does, if you click no, does that take down the assessment on Zillow and stuff? If you click no, it can't even go on Zillow. Okay. 
If you're not agreeing to all of Zillow's terms, which includes them putting as estimate, your property cannot go on their website at all. So that's where you're kind of, um, what's the polite way to say it? I mean, you either check yes to all of them or, or you cannot, I mean, if you want your property maximized on any and every website that it can be, you want these to all be yes. If you're a seller and you can look at that public Yeah, right. Um, going through here, then we have um, a retainer fee. I usually put zero and then 6% or whatever it is that you're charging. And oh, am I just so I'm, okay? Thank you, Nate. <laughs> After I struggled with this for the last forty minutes, um, and then don't forget, sellers shall pay the six. Oh, I have six eighty five, six ninety five broker admin commission. If you notice, that was already in here because in my templates I had that put in there so that I don't forget. Um, because then it's always in here. Um. Next line, I actually do leave this blank because if it says, if left blank, not to exceed six months. Compensation brokers shall offer compensation to cooperating brokers. If shall, I do put this in ahead of time. That could be debatable or arguable. Um, I just, when I'm going through the listing paperwork with my sellers say, you know, in the area, generally we're seeing a 2.7% payout for the buyer's side. Is that good for you? That's what I have in the contract. And typically they just roll with it. Um, I also wait to check this one. I used to always just check that seller directs for broker to arrange for a qualified closing agent. Mm -hmm. But um, most recently I've had more and more people having their own title company. So I've started leaving this blank until I discuss with them at the time of my appointment. Um, Foreign investment and real property tax. I mean, FERPTA, you might know before you meet with them whether they are or not a foreign individual. If you're not certain, I would leave that blank. Um, I do check seller will agree to dual agency before I meet with them because it's my job to explain to them at the time of the appointment how important dual agency is, especially working at a company like EXP where we would be eliminating so many prospective buyers if we weren't allowing dual agency. Um, again, I'm not reading this contract itself line by line. Um, if you guys have any questions on it, you can certainly give me a call. The focus of this, again, was just to primarily show you how to actually complete the documents. Um, another tip, especially when you're filling out, and this is the single family residential input form. This is where it's really helpful to have the old listing. Maybe you're lucky like Hannah and you have to, um, monitors and you can have one up on one monitor or like I've got it going with my iPad, like having this up here while I'm filling out this input form makes such a huge difference for time. But what I was, and I'm, again, this form I would say is very overwhelming. The input form is a very overwhelming form. It's not a complicated form, right? It's just going through it line by line and filling it out. My biggest tip or advice here is after every page, I hit file save. <laughs> I do because I have had my computer crash or the system crash. If you're doing it here and the internet's lagging, you, I mean, I, I would be lying if I said I never cried because I filled out this whole form and then my computer crashed once, especially when I was newer and it took me a really long time to fill this form out. I so, have a question. Yeah. So I know that it's not really advisable to take the measurements from a previous listing yeah unless it was yours and you did the measurements yeah yourself. i always measure every room on my own and make sure that it's correct that you as a list agent are responsible for the information yeah. that you are putting in the system yeah. so it is in your best interest and the seller's best interest to either measure it yourself or hire a company to measure it all of our photographer companies do it and, and the reason i do is just to I did it for six years for the agents I've worked for, yeah. but also when I'm looking at the mechanicals and I'm marking if it's forced air and doing all that, like I'm already in the house anyway. Yeah. So I just did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, and, and I mean, another reason I like to do this is that it familiarizes myself with the house even more. So yeah. I can speak to it, but to each their own. I mean, I just definitely to the ultimate point is I wouldn't 
typically use the dimensions from the previous MLS. Right. You know how many agents have been doing that for years and years and could be 100% wrong? Maybe right. that room was actually 20 by 15 and the listing has been showing at 12 by 10 the whole time. Right. Um, if you're not going to list it, you're, you know, if you're not going to rely on our photographer's measurements, then I would definitely be doing it yourself or vice versa. But um, we really shouldn't be relying on the old listing for this information. Okay, so then sequentially, like you're going that format before you go to the listing format. In theory, right? yeah. This input form, I typically don't fill out before I'm going to the listing. Okay. I fill out my agency, my certification to withhold, um, the listing agreement itself, the net sheet, and um, coming soon. I bring all of those business. and affiliated business agreements. I hold off on this one because it is so lengthy that I don't want to waste my time filling it out unless I know I get the listing. Again, I've done it, you know, like I have a friend's mom's listings coming up. When I went on that appointment, I had this all filled out so I could have her sign it on site, but I knew that they were listing with me. There wasn't, you know, they weren't interviewing other agents. So this particular form, I do hold off on filling out until I have the listing signed. That's what I do too. And then set a time for review and then you can so Hannah said she would recommend bringing it blank and having them sign it and telling them that you'll fill it out with all the correct information. Nine out of 10 times that works. Sometimes you get those uh, sellers who are absolutely not going to sign a blank document. Um, so just, you have to have it signed to turn in, which is why if I don't have it with me, then I'm filling it out on my computer and I'm sending it to them for electronic signatures, so. Also, with this form, so in the top right-hand corner, there's like a key of what yep. needs to be filled out, what's optional, and what does not need to be filled out. If you don't fill out all of the stuff that has to be filled out, then you're going to get one hundred yourself. So. <laughs> so what Hannah was saying is there's a key on this form because not every not every uh thing does need to be filled out right like um right here elementary school middle school high school this is for Rochester school district only which I actually wish more school districts would, I wish more areas would require this. Um, my opinion doesn't really matter on that, but here's a little key, like Hannah was saying, black boxes are required, black, op, black ovals are required for, so here's your ovals, right? Here's your white boxes and here's your squares. So that's your key to know, because like Hannah said, if you have, hazardly do this form, you're going to get a lot of emails from Michelle needing a lot of additional information from you. That makes her life harder, your life higher, harder, and nobody's happy. Um, coming soon, so the coming soon and the withheld, I don't complete up front because again, until I'm meeting with my client, I don't know which route they're gonna go. Are they gonna be ready within 21 days or are they needing to do the withheld and need a little bit more time. So I bring them both and have that conversation when I'm there with them um, to determine which form we need signed. And sometimes I even have both signed. Um, so that's about it. We're about five minutes away from the team meeting. Anybody have any final thoughts, questions? Just remember that your listing paperwork has to be turned in within two days of getting a sign. Yep, your and listing paperwork should be turned within. <laughs> and, and that's all paperwork. And that's not a PHT or EXP thing. That's an MLS thing. So just so you guys know, when they harp on you or request you get dates changed and things like that, that's not us being difficult. That's literally the MLS needs all of the paperwork within 24 hours. Well, I see, I always tell everybody 24 hours because we actually have, 48 hours, but putting a little bit of pressure on you to make it 24 hours <laughs> seems to work a little bit better. Um, any questions, anybody? All right, well, I hope you found this helpful. Like I said, I'm happy to do another one of actually like going line through line on the documents if people would like further explanation on those to be able to feel like you're better presenting them to your clients. And if anybody is interested in seeing kind of how I do the iPad presentation, let us know. Otherwise, we'll see you all in the team meeting and have a great week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>